The Pearl of Great Price Lecture Series, given by Dr. Hugh Nibley. Today's lecture is entitled, The Geological Problem. Well now, we were talking about the new world. Remember it says here, the reason I bring geographic trials is that they're light, easy to carry, and you can get copies of them. Uh, textbooks, there's some better textbooks to be sure. But we were talking about this particular fold, unfold, and his scales on the back and so forth, in which it talks about various times in which there have been mass exterminations, and comes down to this mass extermination. 165,000 years, a million years ago. Here's one back here, 220 and so forth. But they've taken place all along, and after a mass extermination, how mass are they? Oh, 90, 100, not 100%. But the funniest thing is that after each one takes place, new forms of life appear just as suddenly as the old ones disappeared, which is a very strange shift of things. The, uh, and as we said, it's, as it says here, what this amounts to allowing for these mass exterminations is that we are living creation of new land forms as we discover a new planet under our own feet. We're not living in the same planet that dinosaurs lived in at all. <coughs> Some, the same substratum or not. And we have a lot about that in the Pearl of Great Price, a good deal about it. The, uh, <coughs> this doesn't mean, you see, that it's a new earth, a new world. In Matthew 24, which is in the Pearl of Great Price, it gives us that proper version of it, with the chronological order and so forth. And the last verse of that says this. It's given us three ends, the end of the world. It's given us three times when the world comes to an end. It finally gives us the one in our own day, and it follows up by saying, now this is the one that follows immediately after the book of Abraham, writings of Joseph Smith, number one. And the last verse says this, which is very significant. And thus cometh the end of the wicked, according to the prophecy of Moses, saying they shall be cut off from among the people. But the end of the earth is not yet, but by and by. He has three times said it's the end of the world, or the destruction of the wicked. Finally, we get to the last one in these last days. It is finished, but that's not the end of the earth. It's the first time he uses that expression, end of the earth. The earth is something else. That will be, I'm not telling you when, it doesn't concern you now, that will be by and by, it says. Not the end of the earth is not yet but by and by. So when we say these are the latter days and the last days, which they are the last days of what? Well, they're not the last days of the earth, but they are the last days of the world. What changes take place here? Well, I better dig up Brother Schindelwolf here. I have him. Uh, in the 1950s, um, German paleontologists began to notice certain patterns, very, very distinct, sharp, mac, uh, sharply marked, patterns of extinction. I better be here, too. Got it all laid out. Oh, here it is. And this is in uh, 1963, an interesting summary. The interesting thing about this is called neocatastrophism, that the Earth has been destroyed by catastrophe. It's called not the old catastrophism that Cuvier talked about, uh, the flood and so forth. There have been various catastrophes, and neocatastrophe is here to stay. Uh, they mocked it at first, this article is from 1963, and, uh, but now no longer. There's a great deal about it. In fact, you may see more about this in, uh, in uh, documentaries on uh, KUTV and KBYU and almost any other subject now, which is this new catastrophism. So we'll write new catastrophism. Catastrophism. Well, you know the catastrophism. And this is this article I'm referring to particularly here is by Otto H. Schindel. He's not the one that invented it, uh, but he first uh, made the first earth-shaking publication on the subject. It had already been noticed in 1959 by Stepanov, but this is uh, Schindel. And it came out in the... In the uh, Zeitschrift der Deutsche Geologische Gesellschaft for 1963, 114. Now this is the story, as he tells us. Uh, in the history of the world's organisms, he says, especially in the animal kingdom, 
there have been drastic turning points from time to time, especially in the fauna. Uh, there has been, on the one hand, an almost total extinction of numerous uh, species, and at the same time, the sudden emergence of totally different species. At the same time, that's a strange shift, so forth. This, of course, he says, is in contradiction to Darwin's doctrine of gradual evolution occurring by natural selection. And such people have taken it up now, uh, convinced neo-Darwinists like Newell and Simpson have now reneged and have come over and are accepting this. Now, when I first came to the BYU, Simpson, uh, John Gaylord Simpson, uh, Gaylord Simpson was the, was the little tin god. He, everything he said went, you see. He was the, the, the straight Darwinist and so forth, and everybody lived by Simpson right here. But remember, at that time, they knew nothing about plate tectonics. We knew nothing about any of this stuff. Of course, no probes have been sent into space or anything like that. The whole picture has changed now. Well, this is the way he gives it to us. Uh, and that it happened suddenly. This is the thing. This sudden extermination began almost instantly, almost overnight, the same way, and then the reappearance of forms. He gives us some charts here. We don't go into them. Here he gives us a breakdown. He lists, oh, about 40 different life forms. You'll recognize some of them. This is in the, the uh, Archeozoic, which is uh, the Cambrian, the Ordovician, Silurian. And uh, here they are lined up, and they go along very nicely, and they continue the lines. Then, all of a sudden, uh, you get most of them disappear. Well, these are recognized. Well, they are the, how do you read it? The Foraminifera and the Regularia, the Regularian shirt. I remember uh, I went on a geology expedition to Oxnard, California to study Foraminifera and Regularia years ago. And the Annelida, and around here, of course, you get the Brachiopods and the Trilobites and all those things. We don't have with us anymore, but they were very abundant. Well, they disappeared. But then a very interesting thing is between the, then this goes into the Carboniferous, which is the, the uh, Mississippian, then Pennsylvanian, then Permian. And then what happens when you get to the Permian? After all that Carboniferous, they all disappear. All the Carboniferous, uh, all these life forms, the Permian, they disappear. And in their place, all these others appear. See, on the one side, he has a line here. Everything goes up there and stops abruptly. Some of the things bleed over just a little tiny bit here, uh, but not very many. And some of these begin a little earlier, but only one. They all begin all of a sudden when this one begins, this one ends and that one begins in the Triassic and Jurassic. Then they, they carry you over the Jurassic into the Cretaceous, and then comes the big break, the important one for us, that's between the Jurassic and the Tertiary. And that's here when all these forms disappear, all of them go, and all of these new ones appear. There's no carrying over. It's an astounding thing, you see. Well, what's going on here? This is not the picture we had of gradual, steady, gentle, constant, continual revelation, uh, revelation, evolution in uh, response to natural environment and survival of the fittest, the, uh, the, uh, which you heard so much about. Well, now what could have caused it? Well, in the 1940s, they discovered the tectites around Australia first. And you know what tectites are? Uh, they're little bits of glass, not volcanic glass, but uh, little chunks of glass, so big, usually small. They're shaped often like dumbbells, sometimes like little droplets and so forth. Pictures of a lot of tectites here. And typical tectites, they were found in the sea, first in Australia and then various other places. And uh, hey, here's the radiolaria and here's the tectites. These are the tectites. See, the very, these are, uh, uh, these are uh, magnified. But when they fell from the sky, uh, they were in a molten condition, and naturally they cooled off. And as they cooled, their molecules lined up with the magnetic pole of the Earth, which was not where it is today. The magnetic pole of the Earth shifts around, and so we're able to, to, uh, so we're able to um, date them. So these tectites near, near Australia, and they're dated about 700,000 B.C., there, that's the Southeast Asia. Now, what could have caused it? Well, uh, tectites, we'll say, the Southeast Asia. And then the next one were West Africa. And the next one was a very important Nadlinger Rift. Nerdling, the Nadlinger Rift. Uh, 
and uh, then finally the Texas. These are the only places in the world where these are found, and they're always showered out in a particular direction. The Southeast Asia, as I say, dates 700,000 years, million years, you see. And the West African one dates almost an even million years. Now, Nordlinger Rift is very interesting because we see all about them, where they came from and so forth. They're still older. Here is a, a space view of Nordlingen. Nordlingen is a town in southern, south central Germany, very important in the, uh, in the Reformation, uh, conflicts of the Reformation. Here it is, you see. That's the big hole, you see. There's a big hole 12 miles across. The town of Nördlingen is in it. You wouldn't notice if it wasn't from space. It's this big hole. And then all the tektites scatter out from it. And they go clear over into, into Moravia, in Czechoslovakia. So that it's called the Moravian tektites. But they follow out, they fan out in a particular order. Well, that's the order in which this is the hole a meteorite made in the direction from which it came. It's a big meteorite. And it hit a 14 million 600,000 years ago. And finally, the Texas one hit, that's the longest one ago, 34 million. Uh, but this is just uh, the beginning. Uh, now, when, when, when these hit, you see, what happened? They gave a, uh, a very strong jar to the earth. I might as well read from something here. But uh, recently, there have been, just this week, there have been two documentaries. You may just know on the, on the uh, TV, uh, PBS, uh, on this very subject. Uh, certain changes now. Uh, what happened here, Alvarez and his son, two famous geologists. Uh, he was doing some work in uh, Gobbio, in Italy. Gobbio, that's the famous Eguvium. The oldest Roman literature, the oldest Roman writing we have are the Eguvium tablets, the tablets of the Eguvian, and the, they're the Arville, and the uh, Arv brethren, and the Salian brethren. These are ancient rites performed long before the days of Rome there. They're very ancient stuff, you see. Have, but this is much older, because when Brother Alvarez was working in the, here. He discovered between the Carboniferous and the uh, between Cretaceous and the Tertiary, just a one-inch line of about a, a four, three quarters of an inch to an inch line of iridium. Now everything under the iridium belongs to the Cretaceous. These are dinosaurs here. This is where they all, and after this, there are none of them. They're just wiped out of me. They're just swarming here, and there are none of them here. So what happened? Something in between wiped them out. And here is the, this is Cretaceous and Tertiary. This is our new forms of life. Notice how he lists the Tertiary as, they, as it turns to carnivores and the uh, and birds and all the stuff we know today. They come there. But iridium is an element that's very rare on the Earth. But it occurs in meteorites, commonly. So what happened was a big... He, he uh, posited, a, well, maybe a big uh, meteorite struck the earth and showered iridium all over and iridium dust, among other things. It's mixed with it, so you get it out. It's in far higher percentage than it should be. But then they went elsewhere. They found the same thing in Iceland, and they found the same thing, exactly the same sort of deposit, the same order of thing, the same color, sort of yellowish brown. Between these two in Montana, throughout the world you find, throughout the whole world then, there is iridium there is a layer of iridium under which all life is extinguished, above which new forms of life appear. Well, what could have happened there? Now, Richard Miller at Berkeley made another notice, uh, noticed another thing. These extinctions occur almost like with clock-like regularity, geologically, almost every 26 million years. Now, what could possibly account for that regularity? Why every 26 million years? He's got into a big argument with the Alzerises about this, and uh, but the, everybody's coming around now. It's the theory of nemesis in the Oort cloud. This sounds like science fiction, doesn't it? <laughs> the monsters. Uh, that what happens, you see, the sun has a dark companion star, which in its orbit uh, comes in a critical distance from the sun at a particular time. Or it runs into the Oort cloud at a particular time, its orbit being every 26 million years, because every 26 million years, everything starts getting stirred up, and the Earth gets hit with a lot more meteorites than ordinarily. There is a cloud, there is a, spa uh, there is a patch of, uh, of uh, busted up matter out there called the Oort cloud, and it's, it's supposed to be a, a sort of uh, nursery for, meteor for uh, comets. See, we're getting a lot about comets today, aren't we? And this has Halley's and so forth. Comets come regularly. 
And every time this sun hits this Oort cloud, it stirs things up and sends, sends uh, comets scattering in all which directions, and many more than usual come toward the Earth. The Earth gets a regular shower of them every 26 million years. Better chance of getting hit, and so these big things come along and whack everything. And when they hit the Earth, what happens? Well, they, they jar it to its foundations. Here's the Earth. And it is protected by a magnetic field. And that protects it from the, the cosmic rays from outside and from the solar wind from inside, both of which have radioactive particles. They're ionized. They're dangerous. So this is the solar wind here. This is the, they come. There's a place way out in space where they meet and cause a turbulent zone around the, uh, around the whole solar system. But the, uh, the sun here, when this comes, it hits. What does it do? It, it shatters. It breaks down the magnetic shield for, well, you can see where it doesn't hold at the north. You can see these ionized particles in the northern lights up here, north and south. That's, that's, that's why they get through, because the shield goes in, the, in this form. And then out there, there's Van Allen belts and other things to protect it. But when this gets very solidly whacked, what happens? Well, in the beginning, we have the Earth's crust, which is only 20 miles thick. You have its mantle. Then you have two cores in the center. And there's a molten area between them so that they don't turn at the same rate. And that differential acts as an armature. That acts as a dynamo and sets up the electric, the, the magnetic field that protects the Earth. But when this gets badly jarred, what happens? The liquid gets all scoops up and the thing doesn't turn at a regular rate. The shield breaks down and the rays get through. And this, there, notice the double action here. The, well, let's, we should be reading some of these things now. The, uh, maybe we can get some from what happens in the, well, we've all heard this anyway. Namely, Oh, what happens when, when these hit the Earth? Well, tremendous amounts of dust and uh, smoke start fires throughout the Earth, send up dust, cover the Earth with a veil of dust. And they say these last never more than a thousand years, but the breakdown lasts for about a thousand years. But meantime, the Earth is covered with dust. And this one that happened, this iridium one, it happened, incidentally, this is the one that happened between the dinosaurs and us, and that's 65 million years ago. And the... Uh, when it breaks down, the dust and the smoke, especially the dust, and the meteoric dust as well, covers the earth for a period of time and causes most life to appear. This, they figure, at a minimum, 95% of all life forms were destroyed. In that. Uh, it's the equivalent of 5,000 kilotons of atom bombs. We have 50,000 all ready to shoot off. So, you see, there, here comes our, our atomic winter. Um, and uh, which is very real. But what happens, how come, the new, how come the new forms of life appear so suddenly then? Well, when you let these things in, what happens when you get these, these radioactive uh, particles? What do they do to genes? What do they do to DNA? They cause sports, they cause mutations, they cause freaks, all sorts of things to appear. So all of a sudden you're going to have strange creatures coming out, a great variety of them. And then I suppose the uh, natural selection gets to work and uh, certain ones survive and certain don't, but here you're going to have a whole new story uh, coming along, and these creatures appear very suddenly, which is the manner they call them sports, you see, for that reason. They appear because there's nothing to protect them from these dangerous uh, radioactive particles that we're cooking up so much in our own society. Well, um, now comets have built up the Earth. This, uh, this is the, it's the comets that do this. There's nothing you can do about it if they're going to hit the Earth. The... Uh, Let's go to this one. Incidentally, the sections relevant to this, I'm up in Ditford, this book is not in the library. You can't get a very good one. This man is in charge of the, he's sort of the NBC man for the continent. He's in charge of all their scientific documentaries and so forth. It's a good book, but I have Xerox, the relevant passages, the relevant chapters, and you can get them, and you can get them on reserve. Xerox them if you want. There's some interesting stuff here. But you can get this in plenty of other books. This is only a very convenient one, and this is, what happens here, he says here. Mm. Uh, meteors do frequently crash into the moon. Well, this is the moon he's talking about. And the resultant explosions really do hurl large quantities of lunar matter into space. 
This process has been going on for billions of years, so that by now the surface of our planet must be almost buried in lunar matter. You can pick up moon rocks anywhere you go. There can be no doubt that some of us, will, yeah, at some time in our lives, each of us has held a moon rock in his hand. Unfortunately, we cannot tell the difference between earth rock and moon rock. Then it goes to the others. Now, this is a thing that's being taken very seriously today. I say the Alvarez and, uh, and the other boys are into this. Uh, these comets, we're talking about comets, their orbits may be two or three light years away from the sun, enormous orbits. Remember, a comet has two orbits, it's an elliptical thing, it goes way out there. And uh, at these remote points, the comets are already traveling in the border of regions or neighboring the solar systems, almost outside the solar system, where they sometimes cross paths with comets from neighboring systems. They intermeet there. At such times, two comets may actually change orbits. That is, each comet begins to orbit a new sun. Thus, a constant exchange of matter takes place at the border regions of the neighboring solar system. When a comet approaches the center of its system, it falls under the influence of various massive bodies in the region, including its own sun. Now, how fascinating to realize that the surface of our planet must be strewn with matter from other solar systems. Well, the more recent uh, report here, I took down notes on it, uh, is that our Earth is almost totally made up by matter uh, brought to it by comets. The whole thing is put together. That's part of the Pratt's old theory. Remember, he, he used to defend that. Uh, maybe interesting to listen to later on, but you won't have time. Hmm. Now here, each galaxy began to attract great masses of interstellar dust and meteoric material from all the other galaxies in the group. We said the last time how all the worlds share with each other, each partake of each other, they, have made, they make a common course, so forth. this being the old Christian, the old uh, Jewish doctrine. Uh, dealing with the same thing. And so the cosmic debris streams out from galaxies began to form a bridge between them. We actually have a photograph of that going on. The, uh, this matter tears down and builds up all objects that is brought by comets, providing new raw materials for new creation. This metabolism resembles the metabolic process of organic life, a new combination, a new creation. So what a shocking thing to say, how unchristian. Haven't I heard the expression? Uh, I don't you have a new world. Like unto the other worlds we were created. Every time something is said about delivering something to this world, a specification is made. Like unto the other worlds. It's going to be the same matter and the same substance and follow the same pattern. This is nothing strange here. This is what we've been talking about all the time. This delivering among the worlds. This is made uh, like unto other worlds and as far as the matter is concerned, the same thing. The, uh, this goes a long way. Astrospectographers who snapped a picture with illustrations 25, it's in here, were not recording a unique event. The Milky Way are containing matter of other Milky Ways. During the past few billion years, a certain quantity of extragalactic matter, now we're going outside the galaxy, you see, extragalactic matter has continually filtered down to the surface of the Earth from outside this, this galaxy. The picture he's talking about is this, uh, this surprising picture showing uh, exchanges between galaxies going on. It's, it's, it's really something. And remember, there are billions of stars counted, but there are more billions of galaxies. There are more galaxies than there are stars have been counted. Billions and billions. Uh, well, 100 billion at the very least. Galaxies might, and each one has an average of 100 billion stars. So there's a lot of stuff out there. And we've just recently almost doubled the expense. We thought that was the end. It's not the end. But here they are swapping around with each other, and we're doing the same sort of thing. It's the same picture we get in the... Uh, in the books of Abraham and Moses, yeah. and uh, apparently we're looking at an, an actual example of intergalactic exchange of matter, metabolism of the, co of the cosmos. Well, the, uh, yesterday, notice, and beyond is matter, the things you have to have, let us organize it into a world like unto the other world. So we are following the pattern. There's space there. Yesterday, being a nice day, it's 70 degrees now. No wonder. I mean, everybody should be absent if they have any sense, uh, <laughs> including me. But I did. Yesterday, I went on a hike, and I went up Indian Creek. Here, nobody knows about that. It's not far from here, very short distance, with a magnificent waterfall in it. Nobody knows about that either. But I went up Indian Creek. I'd been up uh, late last October. And it was beautiful. I thought it was going to be nice. I'm going to see going to see the fog, going to see how they're running, see if they're really roaring now, because they always run, they drain half the west side of Tiff as far as that goes. And um, what did I find? 
Well, of course, all around I saw irreducible rock. Rock that's the same stuff as the planets, rock that's made of the same ashes, the same, same worlds as anything else. And, um, had been there a long time, but I hardly recognized the place. There were three avalanches. Uh, the first one that covered the trail, you could, you could climb over it and so forth, it was snow. The second one was a humdinger, it was huge boulders, huge rocks, trees all mashed up, completely smashed and took out the trail, left nothing there, you had to climb over it. It was big, that had gone, it's a, sort of a gorge you were down. And then, as you approach the falls, when you approach the falls, there's a perpetual trickle of water coming down, and just because of that little trickle, at the base of it was a huge snow slide. It had come down, the water had caused it to come down. Well, what did we learn from that, the processes of the creations? Well, the Lord has told us, uh, first of all, we start out with the waters, and they're very important, the darkness covering the waters. And as the scripture says, darkness booted over the face of the deep. Is this sort of thing possible? Well, it certainly is. Hope I can find something here. Here we have, as you know, we've been looking at the big satellites of other planets. We're describing amazing things now. Here's the, the planet Io, where seven active volcanoes have been seen in action. Nobody ever dreamed things would be like that out in dead space there. But the most interesting ones are the many planets that are covered with water. Here, for example, is uh, Europa. The whole surface is covered with water, the same kind we have. And here is... Well, this isn't a very good one there. I have a better one here, but just tell you strictly. Uh, and uh, Enceladus, it is coated with ice and long crevasses and broad white marks. On Diona, has water geysers that shoot up from it all the time. So much water around in the place. It's just an absolutely amazing thing. And um, the biggest one of all, of course, is, uh, is Ganymede here. But on... We're talking about moons of Saturn now. It's the uh, Titan. The interesting thing about Titan, there's, a, there's an article here on Titan that I mentioned it. What happens there? It's raining all the time. It never stops. It's covered first with a blue atmosphere, a blue sky, and under that, it's raining a methane. Methane gas. Well, it's covered with methane all the time. And uh, it's a drizzle that sort of comes down. But the uh, gas on other planets is... It can be ethane, which I wouldn't want to light a I wouldn't want to light a match if I was there because that's the gas we use for house, house hot, heating and all that sort of thing. Ethane is a, the next step for methane, and uh, it is uh, very organic. You see, it's a hydrocarbon. It's uh, uh, C2H4. Ethane is very elementary gas, very necessary. We find all these organic elements on these planets. The interesting thing about uh, about uh, some of them are the place that are perpetually raining right now. They have clouds, some of them used to. Now, looking at Mars, we saw that it once had, it once had terrestrial, it once was completely covered with a cloud cover and suffered torrential rains and, and produced those rills all over the place that are so much like rills, you find a few on the moon, but so much like the rills we take from the Earth and from other planets. Let me see what this one is. Oh, yeah. Here's, some, here's a big boy, of course. This is, and now here is Titan. The outermost layer is this bluish transparent haze of organic carbon-based compounds, and below that is a thick layer of smog, it's getting worse like the Earth. Again, organic compounds, but of larger particles, characteristically red. Then, fine methane sleet falls out of perpetual cloudy sky. Now, methane is closely related and acts just like water, it says here. Since methane likely plays the same role as water does on Earth, it can be solid, liquid, or gaseous, and just like water. But on most of the big... <coughs> satellites, and some of these are bigger than the planet Mercury, you see, it's water that comes down uh, and covers them completely. But this fine methane sleep falls out of perpetually cloudy sky, jagged methane escarpments rise from a methane lake under a weak obscured sun where full daylight may be compar comparable to full moonlight on Earth. Well, now look at the picture we get here on Earth. What we have, darkness covers the face of the Earth and so forth. In the beginning, uh, and but we're told in uh, the fourth chapter, I think it's 24th verse, of, uh, of Abraham, first to begin with, there was nothing but earth, and then the rest had to come. You see, but it was it was just a just rock like the rest of them, just uh, uh, silicon oxide, uh, silicon dioxide, the same as the other. So too, just like all our rocks and sand and everything else. And uh, 
So yesterday I saw these mountains and these hills, and I saw the signs of plate tectonics, because we didn't know about that before. Here along here we have a subduction all along the Wasatch Front, which causes an upthrust comes up, and it, it heats the ground, and it gives us, uh, of course, near the coast where it's even more active, gives us things like St. Helens and that whole chain of, of volcanoes like uh, like open sores along the along the Cascade Range, and uh, these things are taking place here. And so what forms first of all out of this uh, are the mountains and the hills, because this is basic. This is the use, the, the motion of the Earth's plates and the motion of its surface. Then what comes next? Great rivers and small streams. Now those are the things that do the work, and that's what I saw yesterday, as you know, great rivers around. But these small streams were breaking down the mountain. They were. That, that big snow slide was caused just by that little trickle, innocent trickle that goes down all the time. And you could see plain enough, you see it uh, among these, uh, I think it's Pennsylvania stuff there, among all these uh, strata, how the water was seeping through everywhere. And there, I wouldn't advise you to picnic up there for a while because there's some very dangerous overhanging rocks there. And they were rumbling down while I was there. Uh, it's still happening. You go up and spend the night, you know, at, at uh, Emerald Lake on Tempest. Lots of fun. You see, uh, all night long you hear just rumble, rumble, just rocks rolling all night long. If you look at the screes, if you look at the snow down there, they're all covered with litter of rock and dust coming down all night, all day long. Of course, especially when the when it freezes at night, gets hard, and in the morning it thaws out, the stuff is loosened up. When it freezes, naturally it expands, it widens the cracks. See, the water melts from the snow, gets down the cracks, freezes overnight, that's dandy. But then when it thaws out, uh, when it freezes, it opens cracks wider and wider, down the stuff comes, so it comes down all the time. So we have mountains and hills, great rivers and small streams. And that gives the face of the earth the characteristic it has. Those are the two big things, as you know, mountain building and erosion. Why? Well, we're told to give variety and beauty to the scene. Was all this being done for my benefit? Well, I'm glad I was good. I was thoughtful enough to go there. Otherwise, it would have been wasted. See? If nobody else was up there. Why did I go and beautify it? So the Lord's tearing down this mountain just so uh, I can enjoy the variety and beauty of the scene. Well, that's legitimate. If you happen to be there, you can enjoy it. But this is another thing we must remember here all the time. The, uh, it's it's uh, for the benefit of others, too. This pluralism we must keep insisting on, namely, that the earth is meant for multiple purpose. The earth is, is multiple purpose. We're told that. See, I've created, I have commanded every form of life to multiply in its respective sphere and element it has its place, and uh, that every form of life may fulfill the measure of its creation and have joy therein. I'm not the only one that's supposed to enjoy this. Others are supposed to, too. This whole thing is to be enjoyed by lots of people and lots of things. But the variety and beauty is, uh, is a perfectly legitimate thing to have there if we're there to enjoy it. It's like the miracles, see. Miracles are nearly always a matter of timing. Uh, the Red Sea often withdrew when the wind was in the right direction or so forth, but especially at that time, remember, there were lots of earthquakes. It was a very active time, and the sea withdrew, and then it came back again like a tsunami. It didn't have to come back much. I mean, if it was a strong wind, it was, a, it was those sand flats by the Bitter Lakes, and the Israelites walked over it, and when Pharaoh has to come along with chariots, with narrow wheels and heavy chariots, they would sink into that as soon as the water came back. Just, I mean, a foot or two would be enough to stall them hopelessly. They couldn't get out of there at all. And uh, that's, it just happened to be at the right time, you see. The Lord can see things coming. It's the same thing. They crossed again. They crossed the Jordan the same way, the way it's described in Joshua. The waters were just a trickling. They were held back, and the children of Israel got by. And it says, then suddenly the waters broke loose, and there was a great rush of mud and, and timbers and, and rocks, trees, and everything else came rushing out. There was a natural dam up there, and it broke, and it came down. Well, it's the timing that makes it a miracle if you just happen to be there. Not that the Lord just uh, uh, said, I'll, I'll do this for your benefit now, but if you can foresee all things when you time things, it, it is a miracle. And uh, not that there aren't other types of miracles, that things don't happen according to rules you don't understand. Brigham Young always insisted on that, no such miracle. But you see, the timing and the coordination of things is so important. So many things going on in the life. And it is to give variety and beauty to the scene for our benefit as long as we're here. The same as we're told about the moon. We're told about the moon is given to us to serve as a light uh, by night. And it does. It does serve as a light by night and has many services for the human race. It doesn't say that's all it does. Uh, we mentioned before, of course, the, 
the claims of certain church fathers. Well, John Chrysostom, that the sole purpose of the stars was to guide sailors at sea. There's no other purpose. Therefore, why should there be life on other worlds? The stars will fulfill their purpose if they just guide sailors at sea. Well, they do guide sailors at sea, but is that their only purpose? This is the thing we have to keep in mind here. Uh, so never forget this, this pluralism here, this multiple use of the earth. It's not made for us alone. We are allowed to share it with God's other creatures, and we're told, say, in, in the 77th chapter of the Doctrine and Covenants, that other creatures have just as much right to the earth as we have. Not only that, but they have spirits and will be resurrected in their own world, in their own time, and so forth. But we mustn't interfere with them in their proper places. We try to build our house up in hand canyons where they have no business being, spend two million bucks and smash down and goes the house. Uh, and of course it serves us right. We have no business being up there that we can visit, we can go with them. But to take it over and want to possess everything which was set up, set apart, remember he tells us he is set apart for various creatures, each proper sphere, its proper element. Well now the question comes, where do we hack in here? Where do we get in this picture? What about the 7,000 years? That's relevant. Our history is only a 7,000 year one. That all important interface between the Cretaceous and the Tertiary. Now that the Earth is formed, divided, and uh, beautified, but it doesn't have plants growing, that's the trouble. Go down and place seeds on the Earth of all kinds. Now, here's another thing that, uh, strange we don't have it in the library here, but I again have put uh, Xerox of the proper chakras, and you can get it, I think, at the bookstore. Lauren Isley, a famous biologist, uh, paleontologist and biologist, called The Star Thrower, uh, a series of essays by him. And here's a very good one, uh, page 67 following. As I say, I have put this part on the reserve. It has uh, the title, How Flowers Change the World. See, this is what happens. Uh, a little while ago, about 100 million years ago, the geologists estimate, now it's down to 65,000, flowers were not to be found anywhere on the five continents. They just appear suddenly overnight. The flower of them first is grass, in this order, grass, flowers, shrubs, and trees, each bearing seed after its own kind, because their whole purpose is to bear seed. Before then, you had spores, you see. These are the first angiosperms, the first uh, plants that have their seeds encapsulated. Angio means a, means a little pot. In Greek, it means a little pot, angus. And inside is, this, is the seed, which is very nourishing protein. And so it, it gives rise to an entirely new breed of animals on the earth. But let's hear what Brother Eisler says about it. Flowers were not to be found anywhere on the five continents. Wherever one might have looked, from poles to the equator, one would have seen only the cold, dark, monotonous green of a world whose plant life possessed no other color. Somewhere just a short time before the close of the age of the reptiles, that's what we get here, that's our, our iridium layer. As I say, they're doing more of that all the time. They're in, in Berkeley at Harvard and Princeton, people working like mad on that. Just a short time before the close of this, uh, there occurred a soundless, violent explosion. Those, these things do not happen gradually and imperceptibly. It lasted millions of years, but it was an explosion. Nevertheless, it marked the emergence of the angiosperms, the flowering plants. Even the great evolutionist Charles Darwin called them an abominable mystery. They shouldn't have happened so fast. And incidentally, the new time scales that are being given are much shorter. Of course, it doesn't make money any difference as long as it's over. Say, you talk about a million years, you might as well say a hundred million years. You're outside of the a fundamentalism by that time, all you have to do is go beyond 7,000 and uh, you're an abomination to fundamentalists. But of course we preach that things were always going on. There's no end to my works. Worlds have always been coming into existence and as one world comes another passes away. There is no end to my word, works are my words. So these flowering plants, even the great, he called it an abominable mystery because they appeared so suddenly and spread so fast. See, evolution means evolution, it does not mean revolution. It's not revolution where things happen suddenly and violently. It's evolution where things unfold gradually, regularly, almost imperceptibly, very slowly, at a regular rate. It doesn't go that way at all. It's a series of violent convulsions all along. So he called it a, an abominable mystery. Flowers change the place of the planet. Without them, the world we know it, even man himself would never have existed. So this part had to come next. You notice there's a succession and process in our story of the creation. After one thing's done, and we were told about the seven main periods, six main periods of creation, the things have to be done in a certain order. Now that the earth is formed, divided, it's time to put the plants on. But the animals aren't yet, because they have to follow. 
Francis Thompson, the English poet, once wrote that he could not pluck a flower without troubling a star. Intuitively, he had sensed the light and that's with the enormous interlinked complexity of life. Today we know that the appearance of flowers contained also the equally mystifying emergence of man. The, uh, before that, we had the under, the, under the layer, we had the dinosaurs, Tyrannosaurus, enormous bipedal caricatures of men who would walk mindlessly across the sites of future cities, heartless and mindless. On the other hand, there's been a new big study by Adrian Desmond that says that the the uh, dinosaurs were probably very intelligent and fur, furry creatures. Well, after all, we don't have the skin of dinosaurs anywhere. And we have the skin of giant thoughts found in caves in Nevada and things like that. But uh, he says they might have been quite clever creatures, quite lovable critters, these, these dinosaurs. We don't know, in other words. But they're not with us anymore. It was their world. He says a cold-blooded world whose occupants were most active at noonday but torpid on the chill night. Creatures without a high metabolic weight are slaves to the weather. How could we escape? A high metabolic rate, however, means a heavy intake of energy. The agile brain of warm-blooded birds and mammals demands high oxygen consumption and food in concentrated form. They can only get it when you had grass, flowers, and uh, shrubs and trees. And the creatures cannot long sustain themselves. It was the rise of flowering plants that provided that energy and changed the nature of the living world. Their appearance parallels in a quite surprising manner the arise of birds and mammals. They come after this has been provided, you might expect. And now, the true flowers. The true flowers, after a long period of hesitant evolutionary groping, they exploded upon the world with truly revolutionary violence. The event occurred in Cretaceous times at the close of the age of the reptiles, as we say, the end of the Cretaceous, the beginning of the tertiary. That's exactly when it fits, and this was written this was written, uh, this is, uh, he died some years ago, and, uh, well, this was published in, um, uh, 20 years ago, I think. No, 78. Okay. Lots of, lots of things have been discovered since then, though it's only a short time ago. But that's, he got the time right then. They hadn't, they hadn't discovered the iridium then, you see, and here it is now. Uh, before the coming of the flowering plants, our own ancestral stock, the warm-blooded animals, consisted of a few mousy little creatures and so forth. Neither birds nor mammals, however, <coughs> were quite what they seemed. They were waiting for the age of flowers. They were waiting for flowers. But with them, the true encased seed. Before that, all is stiff, formal, upright, and green, monotonously green. There is no grass as yet. There are no wide plains rolling in the sun. That has to come first. Nevertheless, the true flowers and the seed that it produced was a profound innovation in the world of life. The seed, unlike the developing spore, is already fully equipped. It's an embryonic plant packed in a little enclosed box stuffed with nutritious food. Moreover, by feather down attachments, as in the dandelion or milkweed seed, it can be wafted on the gusts to ride the wind for miles. With hooks, it can cling to bears or rabbit's hide, or like some berries. It can be covered with juicy, attractive fruit to lure the birds. That's what the fruit is for, to lure animals who will take it abroad. Lure the birds, pass undigested through their intestinal tracts, voided miles away. Ingenious ways of spreading themselves. But you'd say, well, it'd take a trillion years to work that out by accident, a trial and error. The thing is, it happened suddenly, almost instantly. This is surprising. The plants traveled as they'd never traveled before. They got into strange environments and so forth. These fantastic little seeds, skipping and hopping and flying about the woods and valleys, brought with them amazing adaptability. They produced concentrated foods in a way the land had never seen before. Now, that food came from three sources. It produced a reproduction system of flowering plants. The plants were tantalizing nectars and pollens that attracted the insects and so forth. You had to have flowers here. You had the seed, the grasses, which are eaten by the, the grazers, by the ruminants, and you have the, the flowers, which are taken by the insects, the bees and the rest, the nectars and the pollens. And you have the fruits, which are eaten by the big animals, bears and so forth eat the fruits. We eat the fruits. What makes an apple? It's a pod for an apple seed. That's all it's for. It's just to get the seed to it. So the main purpose in producing all of these, see, is that each shall bear seed after its own kind. That is the purpose of bringing forth grass, flowers, shrubs, and trees in that order. So he says, these tantalizing nectars and pollens intended to draw insects from pollenizing purposes. They were juicy, second, juicy and enticing fruits to attract larger animals, and which tough-coated seeds were concealed, as in the tomato, for example. Then, as if this were not enough, 
that was food in the actual seed itself. The food intended to nourish an embryo all over the world like hot corn in a popper. These incredible elaborations of flowering plants kept exploding in a movement that was almost instantaneous. Geologically speaking, the angiosperms had taken over the world. The effect was having an effect, uh, explosions having an effect on animal life also. The flowers bloomed and bloomed in ever larger numbers, and what would you expect? First of all, the grass has a high silica content. It, came, it demands a new type of very tough and resistant tooth enamel. Seeds were taken incidentally in the cropping of the grass, but they were highly nutritious, and so this had the great grazing herds upon the earth, but the first to occur were the great herbivores, namely the elephant of all things, because this, that's the carryover. Remember, like pteranotherms and so forth, you had great animals that, that crossed the barrier there, and the mammoths are the first, a great variety of, of mammoths, as you know, and elephant-related creatures. The, uh, he says here, the new world had opened out for the warm-blooded animals. Great herbivores like mammoths rolled, so first you have the elephants, and bisons appeared. Skulking about them have arisen savage fe flesh breeding feeding carnivores. What do you have when you have large grazing herds? Fierce carnivorous creatures, big cats, so even the lion, the tiger, yes. And finally you have the more, uh, the omnivorous bear who can eat anything, you see. But this is the order they appear in. The, the mammoth, the lion, the tiger, the horse, uh, the bear rather, the horse, and all other things. Soaking about them had arisen savage flesh creeding carnivores like the now extinct dire wolves and the saber-toothed tiger. So we have the elephant, the tiger, the lion, the bear, the horse, and so forth. Uh, their fierce energy was being maintained by the concentrated energy of the angiosperms. That's supporting the grazing herds. The grazing herds are supporting the, the, the carnivores. Uh, enormous game, uh, game herds uh, concentrated the rich proteins and fat of enormous game herds in the grasslands. And so it goes. And finally we get to man, that he comes last of all. So this is an interesting thing. This is where we hack him then. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> it was necessary before the tertiary beasts could occur to have these things happen in their proper order. And this is the order, of course, we get we, in our four accounts. The traces of it in Genesis, very, very clear in, in Abraham and Moses, and most explicit in the temple. Now, um, it's time to uh, go to the Pearl of Great Price specifically and to First Moses. Ah, what a book. We're going to uh, talk about the great dramas and so forth. The author of First Moses could claim to claim to be the greatest genius, literary genius in the modern world because he wrote it before they had discovered the book of Moses before the Enoch had been discovered, before anything was known. And this first chapter is, well, it's the classic drama of every man. It's the fundamental drama. Now, Moses isn't the first man to appear. We, go, we, we take Adam in that order, you see, as Adam appears. We, when we get to Adam, you see, where, do, where does he come in and so forth? Again, there are lots of creatures running around that are going to look like men. Oh, I must tell you about this. Uh, some while ago, I gave a spiel called, and you can get this. Again, you can, it's on reserve. Whoops, not that one. Called uh, Before Adam. And it, it's from Xerox and so forth. And as I recommend, get it at Farms, which is down on the corner of, if you want to get any of this Xerox stuff, because you can get it half price Xerox. You don't have to Xerox yourself. You couldn't? You didn't have price anymore? Oh, the rascals. The reprint of Treasures in Heaven cost $1.75. But wouldn't it be cheaper it to just, wouldn't it be cheaper to Xerox it? It won't probably be cheaper to Oh it would be cheaper because it's not a long article, it's a short one. Yeah, it's a short one. It's only I've got it here. Well, well, farms have become corrupted like everybody else. Uh, well, <laughs> well they're just some reference. Well, well the thing to do, of course. Come up to room forty twelve library and you can take this and Xerox any particular pages that interest you. <laughs> so that's it, because it's divided into separate sections. And uh, this appearance of Adam and primitive man, that's another thing we haven't have to take up. But, uh, well, that, I see the time is up now. But uh, I guess we better talk about that the next time instead of going to first Moses. Namely, oh, what about primitive man? What about uh, forms millions of years ago? What about the old Vygorge? Uh, what about all those other creatures that were running around that look so much like men? Uh, we begin, of course, with the, uh, with the solo man, and you, you 
uh, what whatever happened to the to the uh, you, know, you think of various ones the the uh, saluting the Arc nation uh, the Magdalenian all these cultures all these people that lived long ago they lived far before Adam but what were they doing then and, and when does Adam really what's Adam's date and so forth how is he related to them and like these are questions that we must face after all we have the state of these things have to be accounted for uh, does the scripture accommodate them? Does it leave room for them? Does it actually tell us about them if you only read it more carefully? Well, if you read it carefully, it tells us a lot more than we're willing to accept. Because we don't read anything. Nobody reads anything with an open mind. You see, I already have a set. I already have a prejudice when I read. And before you can fit anything into a pattern, you have to put it there. That's the, the wonderful work of, of uh, Popper, Karl Popper on that subject, to change the thinking or so many scientists on that. You do not have facts here. We're not dealing with facts. We're dealing with hypotheses, and every one of them is tentative. The facts are few. The, the fossil I hold in my hand is a fact. The, uh, the spectrum I see on the screen is a fact, but my interpretation of it is not a fact. That's just my interpretation, unless you want to take it as a literary fact or something like that. Yes, we talk about these facts. These rocks are facts. These bones are facts. Uh, but interpretation of them that is but they don't mean anything unless you interpret them and you interpret them as you please that's all there is to it so you can see Königswald and uh, and uh, who is it with the I saw them once in Berkeley they had the same bones spread out on the table in front of them and they came each used the same bones to prove the exact opposite <laughs> these bones absolutely prove what I say no these bones absolutely prove what I say well the bones were real they were there all right but uh, who are you to follow? No, it's something because it's this time schedule business. People worry about time. And then they're finding a lot, a lot about primitive man now, you know, who walks around and all this sort of thing uh, millions of years ago. And, uh, and uh, what happened to him? What happened to the Heidelberg man and, uh, and the Windmill Hill and all this sort of thing? And the, uh, some of the fakes that he felt. So I guess we might, might as well consider that because there's a place in the scripture for that too.